Uh, this is a 66 year old gentleman uh, with a, uh, it's a T1C prostate cancer. He came to us with a PSA of 9.7, underwent a truchet biopsy. Uh, the transrectal ultrasound showed a one centimeter hypoechoic nodule on the right lobe of the prostate. His uh, uh, biopsy came back showing uh, Gleason's 4 plus 3 adenocarcinoma and uh, he was counseled for a radical prostatectomy. I think uh, we are already in, we have managed to put in the ports, we have done uh, bilateral lymph node dissections and we are all ready to go. Ketan, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear yes, you just yes, fine. We can hear you just fine. Okay, I'll just uh, you. Uh, I'm just signing it over to Dr. Uh, Akshay Bandari, he will take, uh, take us from now. Okay, okay great. The audience here, so we to yes, now. please. Dr. Arun, Dr. Arun. Yeah. Uh, question is, what kind of preoperative imaging has been done for this patient? Uh, we did an MRI pelvis and a bone scan. And, uh, and uh, no findings? No, no. My MRI showed uh, organ confined disease. Uh, bone scan did not show a reveal any metastasis. There was a sub-centimeter node on the right side, uh, iliac region. Uh, and that has been dealt with. We have removed that node. Was it suspicious when you suspicious saw it? You saw it? Uh, it didn't really look suspicious. Uh, the thing was that uh, the MRI pelvis was a little early into his biopsy, after his biopsy, and the patient did have an episode of fever following this biopsy, so probably was an inflammatory node. Oh. Uh, it didn't look very suspicious. Can we go into the uh, operative view? Can, we go can you look the, at the... Uh, Ketan, can, do you have a view of the operating field? Uh, not yet, no. Can we switch to the op interoperative view, please? Oh, this is the problem. I see. Is there a chance to get the feed? So, I... See that we're looking at the monitor. Is there any chance we can get a direct feed from the from the video? Yeah, we just, uh, they're working on it, Ketan. Just two minutes. So I think they should be fine. Okay. All right. Okay. But we can we can proceed, please. Why don't you go ahead, Akshay? Can you just orient us to the anatomy real quickly? Can you, uh, it's hard to hear you, Akshay. Dr. Arun, can you give Akshay the microphone, please? Yeah, I, I, I think so. On the, but he also has a microphone. I think it's not working. I'll just hand it over. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hi. Okay. Can you, can you see enough to give you an orientation? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, thanks. Yes, uh, yes, uh, Akshay, why don't you tell us what has been done and show us some anatomy on the screen, please. So I'm assuming you can see enough uh, because I know you're not getting a direct Yes, view yes, we can, we can see enough. Just, just point out okay, the salient so, structures. Um, took the bladder down, opened the endopelvic fascia, but I haven't done the dorsal vein stitch. I usually don't do it just before, I do it before I take the apex, okay? Uh, we've done... Um, sort of extended node dissection. Um, as you can see, this is the obturator nerve and vessels. Um, we've cleared the pelvic side wall there and same here. Uh, Akshay, Akshay, can you, Akshay, can yes. you just point out to me the pubic bone, the prostate, the bladder? Okay, sorry. So this is the pubic symphysis, the entire pubic bone. This is the prostate. The balloon is deflated, so this is the bladder and this is the prostatovesical junction. This is my fourth arm tenting up my bladder to show me my landmarks. Um, going to the nodes, this, these are the obturator vessels along with the obturator nerve, the external iliac vein, pelvic side wall, and same on the other side. <coughs> Is that good? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So should I proceed or should I wait for the end of you? No, 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 Go please ahead. proceed. Okay, so we're going to get started right here. Now so I like using the hook. Uh, a lot of people like the monopolar scissors uh, and I will switch to the cold scissors later on but at this point I like using the hook. So, so you're incising the anterior detrusor? Yes. 
And my assistant today is Dr. Neeraj, who's done an excellent job so far. So far. <laughs> so you're putting some extra tension on the bladder. We can see that. Right. That was from your fourth arm. Suction there, please. You know, blood doesn't look so good on the screen. You may want to try not to bleed so much. Thank you, Kathan. Okay. It just feels like old times. <laughs> Some bleeders don't stop. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes just cutting right through them helps. So you see your prostate behind you. You see the bladder. So you're. How are you finding your plane? How are you finding where you need to go here? So uh, based on you know tenting the based on tenting up the um, bladder with my fourth arm, it shows me the crater where I need to go. And the key is to go down just straight on it and not skive too much uh, till you hit the catheter. Because people have a tendency to start off here and then keep skiving. And if you do that, you end up in the prostate. So if you see the direction of my hook is like that, and I'm going down till I see uh, the catheter, which should be in, right? Catheter is in, guys. You're pulling the bladder off of the prostate. Yes. It's a little thick wall bladder, but we just saw the blad the catheter. There it is. So I'm going to hold it with my fourth arm. Now clearly the gentleman is intermediately high risk. Do we know where his biopsy is mapped positive? It was the right side. Uh, Dr. Arun? Uh, yeah, you can take this. But it was on the right side, uh, the apex, and that was what was seen on uh, the MRI too. Mostly now, the apex. DRE, I did a DRE on him, and uh, it's kind of a very, uh, I mean, I couldn't really appreciate the margins of the prostate very well. Uh, I didn't feel any obvious nod, uh, nodules on it. So here what I'm doing is I'm opening up the bladder neck a little bit because I'm right on it to give myself a good view. And this is the part at which you should spend a couple of minutes localizing your UOs once this is open because in my mind this is the best time to see them and get an idea because if you know you're way behind then you don't have to worry when you're doing your anastomosis whereas if you're close uh, then you need to worry. So I do this and you see that's the trigone and uh, suction in there please, gently. So my UO is right there. So I know I'm way in the back, so I'm not going to worry about them from here on. So this is where I'm going to join the two ends. And the way I treat the bladder at this point is it's like a gentle inverted U. Um, so that's why I'm making my incision to the side a little bit. I approach it from both sides rather than in the center only. And that's just to avoid working in a hole. And I don't want suction here please to do much blunt dissection here because there are no planes so you want to sharply or you know using the cautery and size it uh, <coughs> so uh, has there been any progress on the video somebody's still working on it can you come and grab this like this please yeah So I'm going to have my assistant hold the bladder and pull it out and that just opens it up a little bit better. Um, yeah, just hold it like that. Good. Just keep it straight. Perfect. They're looking at the monitor. Getting a Sorry about the vision. Suction, please. Keep it in the midline, please. Keep it in the midline. You're pushing the bladder away from me. Yeah. So now you're posterior detrusor. Yeah. And why don't you tell us a little bit about how you're doing enough this? Enough to not work in a hole, but you don't suction. Keep sucking, please. But you don't want to be too lateral because then you run into these sinuses um, before time.
So you're trying to maintain a certain thickness back here. How are you determining yeah, so where you're my, cutting? My cue is my anterior bladder wall, and I know it's a thick wall, so I'm trying to maintain the same thickness. One second, let me get this. Yeah. Okay, suction here. So he is making quite a bit of urine that's adding to it. So we're maintaining that thickness as you can see. And I'm trying to drop the prostate away. So I'm staying in a plane. And once I get the thickness, my idea if I keep going like this, I'll go into the prostate is to start yeah. curving down behind the bladder. There, there is a straight suction too though. The problem is that doesn't, it was their one? Okay, they like you more than they like me then. That's just universally true, I think. <laughs> That's true though. <laughs> suction there. So just keep sucking in the bladder here. So the main thing here is also, just come out, don't keep your suction there, just suck and come out. <coughs> suck in here, is to keep an eye on your posterior bladder because you can sometimes thin it to the point where you can buttonhole it, which is an ugly situation to be in because, okay, come on, please. Because um, Excuse me. then, um, you know, it's a tough location because you're usually inter-trigonal. Inter and um, so you see, you start seeing the beginning of uh, what looks like a good tissue plane, but we're not there yet, so I'm not going to start bluntly dissecting it. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little oozy and I'm trying to keep it dry for you guys because you still don't have an endo picture, I think. That's yeah, correct. that's correct. You know, part of it is a lot of this liquid, though, is urine, and it might be an important yeah. point to talk about fluid management because yeah, we're starting the program. Yeah, we've talked about keeping the fluids uh, down, and I think it's kept it to about Hello? 500 cc. Hello? 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 Who's that? Uh, this is Dr. Dogra. Uh, Hi. Yes. Uh, see, there are so many in the audience, those who are beginner, we like to know the way you are doing this dissection. You are pulling the bladder neck with your left hand forceps and then you are incising with the hook. Is there a chance that you can make a posterior cystotomy as you can straight by end up going posterior to after cutting in the peritoneum and you feel as if, as if you cut the rectum I itself? Can't hear. I can't hear that very clearly. Uh, yeah. The, Hello, Ketan, do you mind Get taking it. those questions? Yeah, or? yeah, I'll take it, no problem. So the question is, can you, uh, can you incise the bladder posteriorly, what we call buttonhole the bladder, where, of course, yeah. And what Dr. Bhandari was saying is that you have to pay attention to the thickness of the bladder dissection posteriorly, but very easily you can go too close to the bladder, and then you make a hole. And that hole happens to be trigonal. Right, no. that will be a trigonal. What we are doing, the way we are retracting with the left hand, the blood and neck should be doing like that. You want to retract it so you can see the thickness of the bladder neck. Because if you Take can't see here, how thick your dissection is, then you don't know where you are. It, it actually is periodically looking into the bladder and then looking okay. on the other side, looking in. If you watch these subtle movements, that tells him where it is. But what he's trying to find now is, is the uh, vas deferens in the, the seminal vesicle, oftentimes there's a layer of tissue just anterior to that that we tend to call anterior denovius fascia, which I'm not sure that's exactly what denovia described, but, yeah. um, but there is a layer of stuff there that, that can be, uh, be seen. And what he's, I think, not happy with his retraction here, so he's going to, uh, instead of holding up with the um, with the catheter, he switched to grab the posterior bladder neck now. That allows him to pull the prostate out a little bit and, and elevate it to get a little bit more separation from the, the bladder to the back of the prostate. So can you pull this? Where is your jasper? Can you come in? Just grab this. Yep. See, and it's really, you can see here, all of this liquid on the field, yeah. that's urine. A little bit of blood, but that's urine. And when you have a very well hydrated patient like this, it becomes very difficult mm -hmm. because you have to continually keep the field clean. And you know, one of the things we all do is make sure that we run the patients pretty dry, you know, because you can't see as well. I mean, you're continually suctioning, the sucker is continually working, and it's not even a bleeding issue, it's just urine. And same thing for the anastomosis. If the bladder continually is filling up very quickly, so come it's, it's, for a second. Let's just difficult. regroup because I should so be at the. So we do purposefully keep, it, keep the patient very dry.
We, we like to give him less than a liter of fluid throughout the case. Um, and with open prostatectomy, oftentimes several liters of fluid are given because there's a little more, more blood loss. Um, so this is standard practice that you dehydrate this patient? We, we dehydrate the patient. Yeah, yeah, standard practice. I mean, not purposefully dehydrate, but don't give too much fluids yeah. and, and preoperatively. It, what we tend to do is, is the anastomosis is finished, we'll have them get a liter of fluid at that point. Suction. So we've had a liter up to that point, another liter, and then we'll oftentimes give them a liter in the recovery room, so they'll get three liters yeah, just of fluid. Yeah, um, But we try to minimize it during the case for this reason. Mm -hmm. He's haplogged, right? Is he haplogged? Fluid? Do you cross match the blood for this patient routinely? Um, I'm sure that practices vary. I personally type and screen. I don't cross match. I just screen them ahead of time, but I don't have reserved blood for the for the prostatectomy. I don't know. Do you know? Do you? No, that, that we do the same. Right. Yeah. So we don't not cross match. Very pretty. So actually, you're going to put a dorsal vein stitch in before you divide the dorsal vein? Yes, so I drop some pubo-prostatics again. You know, every time I try to do that, I get into a sinus. So you can see this is a sinus here. Um, this, you can see, this is the urethra, actually. So I'm just going to go there, um, stay as apical as I can in order to avoid um, cutting my suture when I go through it, through the DV complex. So. <clears throat> And how do you avoid getting the catheter here? Like you taught me how to avoid By not asking. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, you know, I think we were able to see where the urethra is, so just stay superficial to that. The trick that some people so use at this point is to move the catheter. It's basically this barbed suture with a loop at the end. Um, and um, it, it is unidirectional barb, so it's so I'm just going to loop it. The only thing is uh, it has a couple of uh, centimeters distally which does not have barbs on it. Um, so I just like to run it twice to get a good grip on the tissue. So, so Akshay, the V-lock is not available in India, <coughs> but the quill, the quill suture is. Or now it is? Because right. in November it was not. Oh, okay. Now it is. So the other product is V-lock and quill are the two barb sutures. This is VLOC. Um, well, that's. VLOC's good. I don't use it for the DV. Now, Kathan, you just go through the DV complex before, right? Yeah, 90% of the time. I'll, almost always, I'll transect the DVC now before oversewing it. Which is why I don't use the V-lock, but I think if you're putting a figure of eight like this, the V-lock's very nice because it doesn't unravel. <clears throat> yeah, I used to um, not do it when I was at Henry Ford, but sometimes if you don't have good assist, oh, can you cut this please, this is a tool, um, uh, then, you know, you can lose quite a bit of blood, you know, if it's a big sinus, if yeah, you don't sure. have good help in the OR. So I've started doing the stitch uh, beforehand now. Cut that, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, he's starting okay. to feel it. Get yep. this out. <clears throat> so the comment was made that you're you're going through what we all have gone through, which is the, the pain the pain of leaving home <clears throat> and learning how to deal with this you know assistance and teaching them. Yeah. Can you switch my instruments to a hook and the penetrator back, please? the same instruments I had before. So, you know, we are using a zero degree lens just to orient the, I just switched to zero degree before we went uh, live. I was using the 30 down for the rest of this procedure till now. Does it serve any advantage? I think it does serve some advantage. I mean, what you're seeing, you know, you can't see it, but this type of stitch, when you see it this way, you can get it really very tight. I think in the open surgery, if you don't drop it, the stitch isn't tight enough that when you cut it, the whole prostate will release. And then when you bleed, you bleed and you have, a, you have a problem. Here you don't. Here it stays and you're cutting exactly where you want to cut. It won't release usually. I mean, we'll see. He'll go through it. Sometimes it does release. And it, even if it does release because of the pneumoperitoneum, you don't bleed in the same way that you would in an open prostatectomy. So you don't worry about it. 
And that's what we were talking about. I don't put the stitch in to begin with, so I just transect it and then over sew it, and you don't get torrential bleeding. You might get a little bleeding, but it's certainly not torrential bleeding. And again, he has good traction on the prostate. So as he cuts, the, the space opens up a little bit at a time, and he can see exactly where he needs to go. That's the left hand working for him again. Now, Dr. Tawari has done actually a lot of publishing and work on preservation of these structures for continents. So definitely there's a whole, whole role there. So, uh, Deepak, the question, uh, basically, if you can spare the pivoprosthetic ligament, you must spare the pivoprosthetic ligament. The reason for that, you need to divide. There's no question you'll have to divide, but you'll divide more proximally. But if you are sparing the pivoprosthetic ligament close to the sphincter, that means you are not distorting or disturbing the anatomy underneath the pivoprosthetic ligament, which is why we don't divide the pivoprosthetic ligament close to the DVC. That is one. Second, you should not tie suture over the pivoprosthetic ligament because it will not cinch down nicely over the DVC. In order to do that, you have to go through the underneath the pivoprosthetic ligament, come from other side and tie your knot in between the pivoprosthetic ligament. So definitely it has a role. Frequently we've come across situations where there's a broad, uh, rather more broad-based dorsal venous uh, complex with multiple tribu tributaries. Sure. Now how do you handle that situation? Um, do you cut through that and then suture or is there any other better way of... Yeah, I mean the way I handle it is, it, the few times where I'll throw a figure of eight stitch before going through is in that situation. When you have this very big dorsal vein and you are worried about uh, vision losing type of bleeding when you go through it and then you over sew it after. So sometimes I'll put a second stitch, a running suture to over sew it. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to deal with those, but you'll, they didn't he didn't demonstrate it here, but you really don't get a lot of bleeding with the, with the back pressure. I mean, venous pressure shouldn't be 15, 20 millimeters, so you don't, you don't get as much bleeding, even if the sinuses are open. When you cut through these, you can see the sinuses. They're wide open. And with respiratory changes, it'll bleed a little and you'll see the blood in the veins moving but they're not bleeding, and then you oversew it. The other trick is to turn the pneumoperitoneum up. If you have it at 15, you can turn it up to 20. Uh, and you also want to limit the amount of suctioning. It, there's a tendency when you see bleeding to suction, but that lowers the pneumoperitoneum, which causes more bleeding, which means you have to suction more, and then you are in a vicious cycle. Actually, um, if you ask your assistant to irrigate... Yeah, irrigation is a good trick. Yep. That is a Tom Arling's trick uh, that um, the natural behavior is your assistant will try to suck. I mean, he, he will try to help you. I mean, he's trying right. to bail you out. But if you tell him reverse, that he cannot do suction and irrigation at both at the same time. And so while he's struggling with that, you will be done with that part. And, and Tom <laughs> does that very well. And it washes out the blood a little bit. And um, so, because they always, the handle is on the thing and suction gets stuck and it mm -hmm. just keeps yeah, breathing on your open sinuses, but uh, irrigation helps. So, Akshay, are those the lymph node packets from before? Yes. We don't have great graspers, so I just decided to take them together. The only drawback with this is either you use separate bags. I know the lower one was the left side. Yeah, turn the thing around and lift it up, lift the bag up. There you go. Yes, please. Operate. Many of the patients are having a pretty high grade, almost 8, 9, and even PSAs are above 50. We are getting their uh, bone scan and CT or MR is negative. And then rightly he said like in grade 9, many times it's a disseminated disease. Sure. So what should we really, means we are getting probably, uh, we have done about 97 small number, but out of that maybe more than 30 to 40 would be of in high grade. 
and but still bone scan and PSA uh, bone scan negative and PSA is very high up to 50 55 you have operated so and as you are uh, showing in your one of the slides that that may be a disseminated disease going even margins are many times you are getting the even apex positive so really what to do for those kind of patients so high grade cancer is more like a breast cancer so uh, Halstead went through that phenomena in his mind that he can cure all aggressive breast cancers by doing more aggressive uh, radical and then uh, mastectomy and then the super radical mastectomies and things have come down and it didn't come down because surgeons become better, better because they started working with the medical oncologists and radiation therapists. So we need to know up to what point we can go as a surgeon and where we need to have help. So aggressive cancers, I always have in uh, consult that this is a systemic disease. At least there is a 70-80% chance that we'll be talking about a multimodality approach. And multimodality approaches that you may have need um, radiation afterwards. You may need uh, systemic therapy, which may include hormones, chemotherapy. And if you don't need that, at least you need to change your diet, nutrition, exercise plans, and all those things. You need to be radical without getting into the rectum or anything bad, but uh, they do take longer terms of the continence. You sure saw that um, the patients where I cannot do a good nerve sparing and all those things, not because of just the nerves, patients take longer time. I said I just finished trying the posterior layer, it's just uh, what I try to do is reinforce the denominators together and then advance it up. Uh, it's more for hemostatic reasons uh, than anything else. Uh, Why I do it. A needle driver on the left side, please. And we're just about to do our anastomosis at this point. Okay. okay. And from what you just and said, you just you're going to keep the, keep oh, you're not going to keep the fenestrated bipolar. bipolar. Yeah, I mean, I usually do, do do it with this. This is a life surgery. I just figured out keep my bases covered. Um, and they had already given me a needle driver when I was throwing the DV complex, so I have the luxury of using it. But yes, that's why I was using the fenestrated bipolar, because most cases I'm able to do the anastomosis <laughs> with the needle driver and that, um, uh, because we use the V-lock now, so you're not throwing knots. So the, the anastomosis suture is a 3-0 V-lock on an RV1 needle. Um, there are two <coughs> sutures usually that we loop together. Uh -huh. um, there are six inches sutures, but I only had nine inches, so basically I've uh, cut them down to um, six inches and I've thrown a knot. And you just tied them yeah, together. Tied yeah. together. Yeah. And just so just uh, reminiscing a little bit, your bladder neck was really quite quite tight, so I imagine you did not have to reconstruct the bladder neck at all. Right, right, and uh, I, yeah. So that, and then just going back to our initial conversation about the UOs. This is an RB1 needle, it's not a big needle. I know my UOs are way behind, so I'm not really going to worry about them at this point. So I just start off, just like most of you do, off center a little bit to the right side, outside and on the bladder. <coughs> um, the relog does catch tissue a little bit, so you want to make sure it's released. And that's why not. See, this is why I, you know, I don't, I don't loop mine together. I use them separately because then they don't catch the tissue. You don't have all that string inside. Sure. This is just mine. Catheter out, please. It's a nice urethra. Nice urethra. Thank you. Same thing, two on the urethra, one on the bladder. That's all right, I'm okay without the suction right now. Um, before you start cinching. It's important to make sure that these sutures are not too close to each other because it can be <coughs> tough to cinch the bladder if that's the case. Akshay, can you just you speak up a little bit? Up Sorry. Up a little bit? Sorry. Sure. Um, suction, please catheter in. I said it's important to make sure that these bladder bites are well spaced because if they're too close, it can be tough to cinch them down sometimes. So at this point, it is important to instruct your assistant to make sure that the catheter is withdrawn distally into the urethra because the worst thing you can do to yourself is get the catheter and not know about it. So now the only drawback with the V-lock is it doesn't cinch as well as the monocryl did. Pull the catheter back. I don't need it at this time. 
So you have to cinch them one at a time. The monocryl you would just pull on one end and that would uh, pretty much do the job. One of the things that I think is important is to really practice this anastomosis beforehand and know just where you're going to put each stitch, how you're going to hold the needle uh, for, for each suture. Akshay has done this so many times he doesn't even have to think about it, but you really want to get to where this is a second nature procedure and you're not trying to, to guess how it should go, which which direction, and, and don't be afraid to use your, your right and left hand here depending on the, the, uh, uh, the direction you have to put the needle in. Yeah, <clears throat> but the lymph node one, we just, we just did that. Suck that, yeah. no. Yeah, 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 and thought, interestingly, the right. it's not probably ah. clinically significant difference, but. Good, come out, come out. I don't out. know if it's the surgeons, or if it's the system being on the right side versus the left side. So what I want to do is find the catheter out, do pull it right-handed out. surgery with the primary system on the left, which a lot of people do that. See, <laughs> or maybe switch my guys to the left and try it. That one got rejected. Catherine again. Akshay, do you plan on leaving a drain? Leaving a drain? Yes. Do you always leave a drain? Do you always leave a drain? Um, if I do an extended node dissection or if the anastomosis were challenging, I do. If it's a straight out, please, and six guy who I'm not, uh, who I did not do nodes on, I will not leave a drain sometimes. I'm a little bit more conservative. I do usually end up leaving one. So. <coughs> Suction? He has, yes. Yes. Get the catheter in for a second, please. So then, do you ever do you ever, do you ever not do a lymph node dissection? Lymph node dissection? Um, rare cases, focal very small volume Gleason six guy. Catheter in, please. And the suction then? Yeah, very rarely. Mostly, I will do at least a limited dissection. Suction. You will still do a limited dissection. Do a limited dissection. Yes. Good. Come out. Come out with the catheter. Suction. I need to knock your catheter out. It's not out yet. Take it out, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you're talking about Kegel, so, exercises. Kegel exercises. 
you know, there were some studies that have been done that looked at preoperative Kegel exercise and postoperative outcome, and they have not shown a difference. Um, I think what you will find is that the majority of patients who you tell to do Kegel exercises do them improperly. So if you actually have them do some kind of pelvic floor monitoring afterwards, probably 60, 70 percent of the patients who are doing Kegels are not doing them properly. So you get a lot of sentiment that Kegel exercises do not make a difference. And it's true, if you're not doing it properly, it probably does not. And that's the majority of patients. So teaching them how to do it properly is more important than whether they do it before or after.